Helen, I enjoyed your book quite a bit. Oh, thank you so much. And I look forward to discussing it. It uh, really was a very pleasurable read, very easy to read. And uh, I was caught by the subtitle, Exposing the Dark Side of the Personal Finance Industry, which later in the book you call the Personal Finance Industry Complex. Right which includes not only investment banks and brokers and financial planners, but also the financial media, seminar leaders, newsletter publishers. You even include yourself in that bunch right. as a former uh, columnist for the LA Times. You did their money makeover column. Uh, you include yourself as part of this complex and you, you point out, I think with some guilt, that you were uh, responsible for giving people an illusion of control. Can you, right. you, you talk about that throughout the book. What, what do you mean by illusion of control? Okay, um, her, I'm going to backtrack for a minute. Personal finance starts, as we know, in the 1930s with Sylvia Porter. And it's really, in a way, a spinoff out of the self-help movements of the 1930s. The 1930s are known for everything from you know, the hard economic times of the 1930s. You see everything from Alcoholics Anonymous develop in the 1930s to uh, Napoleon Hill Think and Get Rich to um, various social activist movements. Um, you know, fascism and communism both have a huge appeal. And there's this whole fulcrum going on out there. And Sylvia Porter develops personal finance out of this over a period of years. And her goal is to educate people so that this, the Great Depression will never happen again. But it's very much in a way of its time, an idea that we can teach people certain skills and if they learn these skills, we'll all be okay. But what goes on over time is personal finance slowly becomes severed or for, to a greater extent from this. So it becomes less about the political backbone of it, which was always, to be fair to Sylvia Porter, for a good part of her career, a huge part of her thinking. She was a devout Keynesian, for example and becomes simply a list of tips. It becomes, in, in a way, like any other form of self-help, mm -hmm. be it how to cook a perfect apricot lamb stew, how to to toilet train your toddler, follow these 10 steps and all will be okay. And if you don't follow these 10 steps, it won't be okay. And therefore, if you did follow these 10 steps, it has to have worked out. And if it didn't work out, then you didn't follow these 10 steps. Mm -hmm. It's all on you. And that's over a period of years what started to happen to personal finance. Do, do you see the same parallel that I saw between the, the financial media and fashion media? If, if, you, if you don't look like this gorgeous, young, anorexic model, there's something wrong with you. If you don't look like this couple mm -hmm. that's saving 100000 a year, getting 25% return, looking to retire by age 42, there's something wrong with you. Is, do do yeah, you see that parallel? Yeah, I did. It's funny because I hadn't thought of it that way until you mentioned it. But it is perfect in a way because, of course, you know, Anna Winter isn't sitting up at her offices at Vogue saying, yeah. I'm going to put this, you know, 90-pound, 5'10", perfect woman in and make some teenager in Des Moines feel terrible, you mm -hmm. know, about their life. That's not what she's trying to do. But in fact, there is a parallel to that. We do showcase often these either perfect people who have done things perfectly, mm -hmm. and not only have they done things perfectly, they've experienced no ill fortune, which is another huge part of this. And um, the same thing can be said, you know, most people don't have the ability to achieve this. They don't earn the right amount of money. They don't have the ability to save the right amount of money. They have misfortunes happen not at good times, because mm -hmm. of course, when is there a good time to be unemployed? Mm -hmm. And so on down the line. So yes, most of us are not the financial equivalents of 90 pound, five foot 10 models. True. Um, you also mentioned that a generation or two ago, we didn't have the same concerns that we have today. Right. I, I think the, you mentioned in the book, two thirds of people 30 years ago had fixed pensions provided by their employers. Right. And now two thirds of us at best have access to 401ks. In other words, employee sponsored rather than employer sponsored right. retirement plans. And they're not working, are they? No, and I, I want to go to one other thing first, which is the idea that our financial lives has become so complicated. Yeah is, you know, I say I was born in the mid-1960s. Credit cards were less than 10 years old. Mm -hmm. A married woman had no right to her own credit card, so the idea that I would be expected to know much about my credit card would be mm -hmm. absurd. There were no adjustable rate mortgages. Heck, there were no ATM machines. Mm -hmm. This whole, there were no retirement accounts. Mm -hmm. This whole structure that we now take for granted simply didn't exist. And so we were expected the retirement becomes this issue where in the late 1970s, 
First, the individual retirement account debuts, which, mm -hmm. as you know, is simply meant as a supplement for Social Security. Here, mm -hmm. we'll help people mm -hmm. save a couple of thousand dollars a year more. It'll help them out. Mm -hmm. And then followed by the 401k, which is a historic accident. And do you want me to talk about that yeah, a little bit more? Yeah, explain what you okay. mean by historic okay. accident. Okay. okay. So the 401k develops, um, there is a concern among executives at Kodak mm -hmm. and a few other companies. They want to be able to get salaries tax deferred, mm -hmm. you know, high earners we're talking about here. And that, so somebody goes to Congress and eventually there's this little code put into the tax law in the late 1970s called the 401k. Mm -hmm. And these high-end executives get the right to put some of their money aside on a tax deferred basis. No one really thinks anything of this mm -hmm. except for one man, an attorney named Ted Benna. And he sees that, why should it just be high-end executives? Mm -hmm. Can't this be all of us? And he gets the Reagan administration to agree with his viewpoint on this. And this takes place by this time as the early 1980s. Then the next part, which almost nobody foresaw, is the idea that, wait a minute, we don't have to give people pensions, do mm -hmm. we? These 401ks are really could be substitute for a pension. And this is where the corporate co corporate cost cutters start creeping in. Mm -hmm. And they say, hey, even if you're going to match at 3% or 6%, mm -hmm. it's a lot cheaper than funding a pension. Mm -hmm. And besides, a lot of people won't sign up anyway. So don't worry about that 3 and 6%. Mm -hmm. And slowly but surely, over a period of many years, the numbers drift down to where we are today. And of course, this was all happening while the stock market was just raging through right. the 80s and 90s, and people thought they were forever going to get 20, 25 percent returns a year. Right. And that's the other part of this, is there might well have been more opposition, mm -hmm. except for the fact the, the stock market, you know, increased doubles and doubles again and doubles again and right. doubles again in the period between 1982 and depending on how you're counting, either 2000 or 2007. Mm -hmm. So people think, begin to think, that this is the natural order of things. Uh, Gallup does a poll in the late 1990s where people expected 30% average annual returns in perpetuity. Not one year, right. but every year. People have, an, we all have a bias towards the recent past, as we all know. And so people just saw this almost as a guaranteed investment scheme. But to be fair, that's also how it was pitched at them. Right. And you could see it. You could go into things like Money Magazine and the other financial journalism of the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's the 401k is what some person I think actually wrote. There's the little engine that could. Mm -hmm. Just keep putting your money away and you're going to be fine. And now most people feel that they're going to retire destitute, and yet we seem wed to this system. We are. It is the surveys show repeatedly 80% mm. of us think the 401k is an absolute failure. And at the same time, they show that we don't want to get rid of it, which is really fascinating to me. And the only thing I can think of is that first, of course, you know, everybody likes to get their money. Mm -hmm. But second, when you have real social change, one of the things that to me is always really interesting about social change is that when it is complete, you forget how it once was. Mm -hmm. And I always use the example of when I tell people that a married woman had no right to a credit card the year I was born, I've literally seen jaws drop open. And that's from people mm -hmm. who work in the finance industry. Mm -hmm. People just can't even conceive of that world anymore. Yet it was 40 years ago. It was less than 40 years ago. And I think the same thing is true of the retirement universe. We don't see any longer how it once was the people who had pensions are slowly but surely dying off. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that most intrigued me in the post-2008 period was that you would think we all would say, oh, let's get ourselves pensions again. And mm -hmm. in fact, the survey data shows we do want pensions, and people are saying mm -hmm. that. But our real response has not been to organize to get ourselves pensions. The real response has been to try to get the pensions away from the last people who have them, which mm -hmm. are people like the Auto Workers Union, teachers, teachers, government workers. We're not saying, we want that. We're saying, let's take theirs. Sad. We have now this personal finance industry complex allegedly right. seeking to help, help us with all of this complexity. Right. And as you point out in the book, that, that help is dubious at best. You introduced the standard, uh, the, the term fiduciary standard, and you, you talk about how important it is for people to understand what that term means, and few do. Would you explain to us what fiduciary standard means, why it's important, and why you should know what it means before talking to any financial professional? Right. Um, but I should say, uh, anywhere between two-thirds and 90% of us have no clue what this means, depending on what survey you're looking okay. at. Is The fiduciary standard is the idea that 
somebody who is d giving you financial advice is going to act in your best interests. Mm -hmm. In fact, the vast majority of people who call themselves advisors mm -hmm are really salesmen who have a duty to adhere to something called the suitability standard, mm -hmm. which is simply that it be